Welcome back Highlanders to the second lecture video for chapter 6 in our Econ 143 class. Uh, remember where we left off last time, we were talking about using an affluent tax, which is a tax per emission, to get firms to reduce their number of emissions to the socially efficient or uh, optimal amount of pollution. Uh, with that in mind, we left off by talking about two firms with different marginal abatement cost curves. We talked about All-American Power, or Firm A, and Big Energy Incorporated, Firm B. And given their respective marginal abatement cost curves, right, we needed to calculate what the appropriate tax would be and what the optimal number of emissions would be for each firm. With that in mind, here's how we did it. Right, we said the government wanted to reduce emissions to 200 total units. That was the optimal amount of pollution that we figured the uh, Earth could handle. Uh, with that in mind, uh, E sub A plus E sub B, or the emissions from both firms, have to add up to equal 200. And there, these are their mar uh, respective marginal abatement cost curves for each firm. And so the uh, efficiency constraint is to set those two marginal abatement cost curves equal to one another, and then plug in your abatement constraint, which is E sub A plus E sub B being equal to 200 into that equation, and then solving for uh, E sub B star, so the optimal number of emissions for firm B was 40 units, and then e, uh, e sub A star, the optimal number of emissions for firm A was 160 units, and then you plug in that um, 160 into your MAC sub A curve, and you plug in that 40 into your MAC sub B curve to get the optimal tax rate. And uh, as long as you do it right, it should come out to the same number, which is $160. That would be your tax per emission. From there, you can figure out the tax cost, which is your tax per emission times the number of emissions. And then the abatement cost, which is the cost of getting rid of those pollutions from their maximum number of emissions down to the uh, efficient number of emissions. And then you add your tax cost and your abatement cost in order to get the total cost. So that's where we left off at the end of our first lecture video for this chapter. So we're going to kind of uh, continue on with this example uh, and talk about what would happen if the government got a little overzealous in terms of controlling the firm's behavior. So what would happen if the government imposes an influent tax but also regulates both firms to produce only 100 tons each? So the government decides to go ahead and charge that optimal affluent tax of $160 but then also regulates both firms to produce only 100 tons of emissions each. So rather than letting them choose the amount of emissions they want to produce, the government says there's two firms, there's 200 total, you're each going to produce 100, and you're each going to be taxed 160 on the 100 that you do produce. Right, how would that affect the total cost for each firm? So let's go ahead and take a look. In order to do that, I'm going to exit the uh, full screen uh, mode here. Right, so remember that our marginal abatement cost curve for firm A Um, MAC sub A is equal to 800 minus 4 E sub A, right? But this time, we're going to go ahead and say that our number of emissions is 100. So this is at E equals 100. So then we're going to plug 100 into that uh, marginal abatement cost curve from the previous slide. Again, I'm just going back here to this previous slide. I'm using that MAC sub A is equal to 800 minus 4 E sub A. Here with E sub A has to be equal to 100 according to this new government rule. So that's 800 minus 4 times that 100 is equal to 400. So the way that we are going to draw this on this graph is that the government here, we're going to call this E sub A G. So this is the amount of emissions for firm A, given that the government is uh, mandating this 100 emissions here. Right, where that's going to hit our marginal abatement cost curve. Is up here at 400, which is what we calculated out there earlier. And then we need to do the same thing for firm B. So this is MAC sub B at E sub B is equal to 100. And again, we're just using the same graphs from the last problem. Um, we just uh, kind of cleaned them up a little bit to not include calculating total cost. Because we're going to do that again here after we uh, calculate out uh, what this uh, government policy is going to do. So again, we're going back to our old... MAC sub B equation of 200 minus E sub B, 
Only now the government has set E sub B to be equal to 100. So that's going to be 200 minus 100, which is going to be equal to 100. So in other words, when we have E sub B, G, oh, I'm going to do that in purple to keep that straight for you guys. So when we have E sub B, G of 100 for the emissions, That's going to hit our marginal abatement cost curve right here at 100. All right. And then once again, we need to go ahead and calculate out these costs. So remember that the total cost for firm A is going to be equal to our tax cost. Plus those abatement costs for firm A. Let's go ahead and figure out where those tax costs are. So we know that they have 100 emissions. That's what the government has uh, mandated it to be. We also know that they are charged $160 per emission. So the tax cost for firm A is going to look like this rectangle here. See, and that's going to be your tax cost for firm A. And then we want to figure out the abatement cost for firm A. Well, they're going from 200 emissions all the way down to 100, with the marginal cost of that last unit of emission being that $400, right? So the abatement costs are going to look something like this. For firm A. So we can go ahead and start calculating that out. It's just the area of that box there, which is 160 times 100. Plus the area of that triangle that represents those abatement costs, which is one half of 200 minus 100. That's the base of that triangle times uh, the 400, which is the height of that triangle. And if we calculate this out, then that's going to be equal to 16,000 plus one half of 100 times 400 or one half of 40,000 is 20,000. That's going to give you a total cost in this uh, example of $36,000 for firm A. So it looks like firm A's cost is $36,000 under this new policy. Compare that to their total cost under the old policy where the government just said, all right, we're going to tax you $160 per emission. It's up to you to figure out how many emissions you want to do as long as your total emissions together is under $200. Uh, as it looks like uh, that total cost is $28,800, right, indicating that the um, government has raised the cost of this firm from $28,800 to $36,000. Right, again, if you're looking at those two numbers, that looks like a difference of about 7200 that is uh, uh, the government's costing this firm with this new regulation. But let's take a look at how it worked out for Firm B. So again, Firm B has that same equation. It's going to be their total cost for Firm B is going to be equal to the tax that Firm B pays. plus the abatement cost for Firm B, so if we're figuring out the tax cost for Firm B, again we know that Firm B is being char is um, emitting 100 units and being charged $160 per emission, so that's 160 times uh, 100 units or the area of this box here is going to be representing the tax for Firm B. And then they're abating emissions from 200 just down to 100 now, right? So again, the area of this triangle looks like the abatement cost for B. So we can go ahead and calculate those out. So if we're looking at the tax cost, again, it is 100 emissions times $160 per emission. In 160 times 100 
was sometimes there's a lag when these colors change there we go plus the abatement cost which is equal to the area of that triangle which is one half again the difference between 200 and 100 times the height of that triangle which is 100 All right, so if we are calculating that out, again, that 160 times 100 is 16,000. Plus that abatement cost of one half of 100 times 100 or one half of 10,000, which is 5,000. And that is going to be equal to... $21,000 in total cost for firm B. Now let's compare that to, again, when the government just said that we're going to tax you towards, uh, to, to uh, tax you for your emissions rather than regulate how much emissions you're allowed to do. And uh, that's going to come out to uh, 19200 under the old system. Under the new system where they both tax and regulate it, it was 21000 So again, we've increased the cost to firm B from 19200 to 21,000, that's about an $1,800 increase for firm B. So we've increased the cost for both firms, but we haven't really helped out the environment at all, right? Under the previous example, we had a total of 200 emissions where firm A was emitting 160 and firm B is emitting 40. Under this new example, we still have 200 uh, total emissions, right? We just have each firm doing 100 tons of those emissions. So when it comes down to it, this doesn't really help the environment at all, it just hurt the companies. So it can be problematic if the government gets too heavy-handed with the way that it wants to try to control people's pollution or uh, businesses' pollution. Um, so having an affluent tax by itself might be more opt and allowing the firms to decide how much to emit might be more optimal than combining an affluent tax with a regulation. If you're going to have an optimal affluent tax, then you should allow firms to operate uh, as they uh, prefer under that affluent tax rather than combining that affluent tax with the amount uh, with the uh, regulated amount that each firm is allowed to produce because again each firm is going to be able to figure out what their optimal amount is given that affluent tax and that uh, um, total amount that the entire industry is allowed to pollute so with that in mind again it might be cheaper if the government doesn't get too heavy-handed with some of these policies so let's continue on here and talk a little bit about uh, firms incentives as a result of an affluent tax right so with that in mind when it comes down to uh, the government taxing these emissions that firms are creating the question is how far should the firms go to then reduce their number of emissions using better technology so we know that a firm can reduce total costs the cost of both taxes and abatement through better and more cleaner technology we talked about how uh, more advanced technology might be something that shifts that marginal abatement cost curve downward in such a way that lowers your cost of getting rid of emissions. With that in mind, firms will only do this if the cost of the new technology is lower than the cost savings that that new technology provides. So in other words, firms will only adopt a new technology if that new technology is cheaper than the uh, savings from um, uh, that uh, new technology should they adopt it. If the new technology is too expensive for firms to adopt, then there is a chance that the government could convince firms to adopt it. And one way that they can do that is through subsidies or something or some other way to, uh, again, maybe a tax break or, again, perhaps a new regulation that will give you a fine if you don't adopt those new technologies. So that's one way that, again, the government can step in and force firms to adopt a technology that maybe would be too expensive for them to adopt otherwise. Let's go ahead and graph that out real quick. So I went ahead and drew a graph in advance so you, you wouldn't have to see me struggle through it. Uh, we all kind of understand um, what this graph looks like by now, at least I hope you do. Right, again, the optimal number of emissions is where the tax and the marginal abatement cost curve intersects. Right, with that in mind, we know what our original tax costs and abatement costs are going to be. So we'll go ahead and do that here in uh, red. Right, so we have original tax costs being the area of this rectangle here. And our original abatement cost being the area of this triangle here.
So we'll call this uh, abatement one and uh, tax one. Okay. So with that in mind, we know that the total cost for this firm is equal to the tax plus the abatement. Again, something you're definitely going to need to know for a quiz or exam. Right, but what would happen if technology were to shift our MAC curve right, to a different MAC curve? In order to illustrate this, we're going to go ahead and draw our new MAC curve looking something like this. So again, we're going to adopt some new technology. We're going to call this MAC2. So what's happening here is that uh, this new technology, or more advanced technology, if you will, will shift our MAC curve. from MAC1 to MAC2, right? And in doing so, this is going to reduce, this will reduce the optimal emissions from our previous E1 star to a new optimal emissions where that new MAC curve intersects our tax here at E2 star. And that should make sense, right? If we have a new technology that makes it cheaper to uh, abate emissions, then we're going to abate more emissions. And so the optimal number of emissions for this firm is going to drop from E1 star to E2 star. So now we need to figure out what the new total cost is going to be uh, for this particular firm. So the total cost in the second situation, call this total cost two, is going to be equal to the new tax, which is going to be, again, the tax per emission times the number of emissions. So this area here. So we're going to call this tax two plus the uh, new abatement costs, which are going to be, again, this area. We're going to do this in purple. This new area under the marginal abatement cost curve at E2 star. So again, this right here is going to be your abatement two, right? With that in mind, you can see that there's a difference here in these costs that's going to be given by this area here. And that difference is essentially the uh, savings from the new technology. So, in other words, our tax one plus A one minus our tax two plus A two and again A two is given by this purple area here. That's going to equal the savings from new technology. And that's what we need to compare to the cost of adopting this new technology. when we are making a decision as to whether or not we want to adopt it. So when it comes down to it, if the savings from the new technology outweigh the cost of adopting the technology, then we're going to adopt it. Having said that, if the cost of adopting the new technology is greater than the savings from adopting the new technology, 
then we may choose not to adopt it, again, unless the government encourages us to adopt it by subsidizing it and or uh, giving us a tax break or doing something that's going to make uh, adopting that new technology more lucrative for us. So that kind of concludes our discussion on these affluent taxes and how they affect these firms. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about some other difficulties when it comes to centrally planned or government controlled policies. As we just talked about, the government gets too uh, heavy handed in terms of trying to regulate our number of emissions while also uh, taxing us per emission. It can be less efficient than if we were just allowed to choose our number of emissions under this uh, tax. Uh, again, because as individuals who are running our own businesses, we might be able to know more about what's more, most efficient for a business than, say, a government official who doesn't know a lot about how the business is run. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about sources of government failure. So I mentioned this in the last slide, but it's worth repeating that whenever you have markets, you're going to have market failure. And we talked about the four sources of market failure in the last lecture video. Right? Remember, lack of competition, lack of information, the presence of externalities, and public goods. And then whenever you have market failure, you tend to have a reason for the government to get involved to overcome that market failure or these government solutions. And again, that's where a lot of economic textbooks kind of stop, assuming that the government's going to come up with the optimal solution to this market failure. When in reality, wherever you have government solutions, you also tend to have government failure or sources of government inefficiency. So again, when you're deciding what's the best course of action through life, then you're really comparing market failure versus government failure. Again, there's not really any perfection to be had anywhere. So if you're somebody who likes to deal with the market failure more than the government failure, you might be against some of these government solutions. If you're somebody who'd rather deal with the government failure than the market failure, then you can be for these government solutions. But again, it's more of a preference thing. I don't think it need, uh, either side right, is um, going to get uh, what they want in terms of a optimal or perfect solution. Right, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about these sources of government failure. I'll kind of mention them here and then we'll talk about them individually. But the first source of government failure is a lack of profit motive. So when the government does any kind of production or regulating or anything like that, they don't have the same profit motive that the private sector does. And unfortunately, that means they might not do things quite as efficiently as the private sector will. In fact, they may have more of an incentive to operate inefficiently than efficiently, as we're going to talk about. The next source of government failure is the short-sightedness effect. And this is the idea that politicians are going to tend to favor programs that have current and very visible benefits. If the costs outweigh the benefits, as long as those costs are hard to identify or happen way out into the future, Again, as a politician, uh, every politician is going to have this incentive, right, to give people the things they want now to make them really popular and let the next person worry about paying for it. As long as we're letting the let next person worry about paying for it, it'll probably never get paid for. And then the final uh, source of government failure that we're going to talk about is kind of combining these two, rent-seeking and the special interest effect, which goes hand in hand. Rent-seeking is the idea of lobbying. Uh, the more time and effort and money that companies spend lobbying, then the less time they spend being productive. And the special interest effect is when the government grants uh, special favors to certain groups of, in, of uh, individuals or businesses, right? And uh, usually in exchange for something in return, maybe campaign contributions, promises of votes, or things like that. And this has kind of gotten a, uh, a relatively new term uh, called crony capitalism, or sometimes just referred to as cronyism, where, again, the government is kind of in bed with certain businesses to help gain them a, a, a competitive advantage over other businesses. So we'll go ahead and talk about all three of these in turn. So with that in mind, let's start off with this idea of the lack of profit motive. So we have the private sector and we have the government. Both can operate either efficiently or inefficiently. When it comes to the private sector, if it operates efficiently in such a way that it can keep its costs down and its prices low and its customers happy, then chances are it's going to make a profit. And uh, when businesses make profits, then other businesses see that they're making profits and they're going to jump in that industry or this business is going to expand its way of doing things. So we talked about that way back in Chapter 3 when a business is making those positive economic profits or doing better within that uh, industry than it could anywhere else. 
then people are going to kind of jump in and copy their ideas and these ideas are going to expand. Now, if a business does not operate efficiently, if it can't keep its costs down or its price is low or its customers happy, then chances are this business is going to start making losses. And if it makes losses long enough, then it's going to go out of business and free up those resources for the more profitable businesses, right? So again, a business has a, or a private sector business has a huge incentive to operate efficiently or do the best that it possibly can. Because if it uh, operates efficiently and makes profits, then the business owners get to keep those profits and take them home to do things like put food on their family's table or put their kids through school, right? If it operates inefficiently, then it's going to go out of business and those employees, and in particular that business owner, they're going to lose their livelihoods. Now, when it comes to the government, it kind of operates in a different kind of manner, right? The government operates in, ter in, the t in terms of having these bureaucracies, and these bureaucracies have to operate under a budget. And it doesn't matter how well they operate because they don't get to keep what's left over in the budget at the end of the day, right? So what happens if the government does operate efficiently and comes in under budget? Well, there's a chance that they could actually get that budget reduced. After all, when they're applying for their budget next year, right, the uh, whoever's in charge of allocating those budget funds and be like, well, you did it for about half your budget this year, so you probably don't need as much money next year. So if you operate efficiently, your budget will get reduced, and that means that bureaucrat will have less power or less leeway in terms of how to spend that money. Now, if they can't come in under budget, if they don't operate efficiently and end up um, coming in over budget, then when they apply for their budget next year, they can make the case that, hey, we just couldn't get it done for this amount of money, and in that particular instance, they could actually have their budget expanded. So if anything, a government sector might have an incentive to, incentive to operate more inefficiently rather than efficiently. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples of how this works. So when I was working at a produce warehouse in West Virginia, uh, back where I grew up, I was um, doing things like loading trucks or going through uh, produce, and uh, Everybody at that warehouse would usually try to operate as efficiently as they could, right? Knowing that if they weren't operating efficiently, they could get fired and uh, chances are the company could lose money and potentially go out of business. Now in that same warehouse, we actually rented the second floor of that warehouse to the uh, uh, state and the state would come and do things like store furniture and uh, filing cabinets in that uh, second floor. And whenever the state workers would uh, come to the warehouse, right, they would use our freight elevator to take all that equipment up, and then they would just kind of disappear for a while. Like nobody would see them for about an hour or maybe two hours, and then they come down, and I don't know exactly what they were doing up there, but it did smell a lot like marijuana whenever they left that uh, freight elevator. So chances are they're just up there smoking it up. And then uh, they would sit on the loading dock and smoke for another hour or two before they actually go back to the state office. It got so bad that one time my supervisor actually yelled at him, telling him to get back to work, and I had to correct him, say, hey, Kevin, that's not, those aren't your employees, those are the state workers. And he's like, well, I mean, I pay taxes, so technically they do work for me, and he did stop loafing around. So again, if it was uh, the employees of the warehouse or the private sector who would act like that, they'd probably be let go, because they'd be costing the owners of that warehouse money. But because it was the state, there was nobody there to tell them that they needed to get back to work or operate more efficiently unless you count my supervisor kind of doing it out of line. And uh, another, kind of another example of how this works is that big universities are often kind of like these uh, government bureaucracies, right? They get state funds, and again, uh, they don't necessarily get to keep what's left over at the end of the day if they come in under budget. So when I first got to uh, Florida State University, where I was working before I came out here to UC Riverside, I remember one of the uh, secretaries for the economics department came to me and she says, you have to order new furniture. And I'm not a furniture kind of guy. Uh, I didn't really care what kind of furniture I had. I was like, no, nah, I mean, the desk and chair I have is fine, right? Uh, I don't need new furniture for my office. And she goes, no, you don't understand. You have to order new furniture. We have a furniture budget. If you don't order new furniture, then uh, we're going to lose that furniture budget. So uh, you need to go ahead and order that furniture for us. So I was like, fine, whatever, send in the furniture guy. So they send in the furniture guy that they usually work with. He's like, what kind of furniture do you want? And I was like, ah, I don't really care. Uh, if it's up to me, you wouldn't be here at all. So just give me whatever everybody else is getting. So he started rubbing his hands together. He says, great, I'll go ahead and get that furniture right out to you. So the furniture comes. It's nice. Again, I don't really care that it's nice. I don't think my students care that it's nice, but it's there. And then the secretary comes to me and she says, did you know that your new furniture costs about $3,500? 
And I said, no, I didn't know that at all. I just told him to give me what everybody else was getting. Apparently, everybody else was getting $3,500 furniture. I mean, after all, why do we have the incentive to look to see how much it costs if we're not paying for it and if we're told we have to get it regardless? Right? So, again, when it's uh, not your money that's on the line, right, you tend to operate in a more inefficient way. That's where you kind of have a lot of jokes about how the government operates inefficiently. Uh, if you ever heard of the expression good enough for government work, it means it's not really that good, just barely good enough to pass if that. Right. If you ever hear jokes about how inefficiently the DMV is run, right? If you ever notice the kind of long lines that tend to exist out at the DMV, particularly here in California, right? Those kind of long lines usually don't exist out at Walmart, even though far more people go to Walmart for their shopping every day than who go to the DMV every day. Again, there's just no incentive to operate as efficiently. Uh, you have to go to the DMV whether you want to or not. That's usually why you're there. You don't have any uh, competition to choose from. It's like the DMV gets to keep any extra money at the end of the day if it does operate in an extra efficient manner, right? So again, that lack of profit motive is one source of government failure. Another source of government failure that we uh, talked about is the short-sightedness effect. Again, this is the idea that politicians tend to prefer programs with current visible benefits, even if the costs outweigh the benefits, so long as those costs are hard to identify or exist far out into the future. And before I continue on with this idea, I just want you to know that this isn't kind of a Democrat thing or Republican thing. This isn't a liberal thing or a conservative thing, right? Essentially, all politicians act this way because they all face the same incentives once they're in office, right? So if you are, say, President Bush here, you don't necessarily care about the amount of debt that you're racking up, right? You're going to promise people these uh, government programs and you're going to give it to them. You don't want to raise taxes because that's going to make you unpopular. You'll let the next president worry about paying for all these things. Of course, if you're the next president like President Obama, you come in, you've got this recession to deal with, you want to make sure that people are taken care of, you also want to get reelected. So again, you're going to pass all these positive government programs, you're going to give people all this money, and you're going to let the next person worry about paying for it. Of course, when Donald Trump gets in there, he's not worried about paying for anything. He's going to keep giving people what they want and lower the taxes while they do so. And again, it's going to continue on like that. That's why you see national debt increase pretty steadily, especially over the last uh, 30 years or so, right? If you want to see how bad that national debt has gotten, you can just take a look at our U.S. debt clock. I've gone ahead and uh, pulled that up for you, and that's what it looks like. It's about at a little over $25 trillion now, and as you can see, it's increasing pretty rapidly. I won't leave this uh, up here for too long because I know it stresses some people out, but just to give you an idea of how fast that's increasing, it's increasing about a million dollars every 22 seconds. So every 22 seconds, our uh, nation is a million dollars more in debt than it was 22 seconds ago. Uh, I'm not going to really talk about that debt too much in this class because it's not really part of the environmental economics. It's just kind of an example of how rampant that short-sightedness effect can get. All right, so there it is. Right, again, again, another source of government failure that is all too real. With that in mind, we'll go ahead and uh, talk about the next source of government failure, which is that idea of the special interest effect, right? So the way this works is that the special interest effect is the idea that the government will tend to favor programs where the benefits are concentrated on a small, well-organized group of people, uh, even if the costs outweigh the benefits, so long as those costs are spread out over a, um, a, a wider, unorganized group of individuals, Right, Because, again, the people who get the benefits are going to be lobbying harder than the people who are getting the costs uh, with regards to them lobbying against it. So let's go through an example. So the number of employees in California is around 17,500,000. And the number of people in this class is about uh, 90 people, uh, 90 students registered. Uh, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and institute a policy that says, hey, let's lobby the government. In fact, we could even make it a class project. Oops, didn't mean to do that. So we're going to make this a class project to lobby the government and say, hey, let's go ahead and tax everybody in the state of California just $1 per year as a payroll tax. All right, so every employee pays just $1 per year. And that's going to come out to $17,500,000 every year that the state of California will collect just by taxing all its workers just that $1 per year. And let's go ahead and, again, as a class project, lobby that the government not only institute this tax, but give it to us to further enhance our environmental economics research. 
We come up with a lot of ways in which we're going to use this money to help improve the environment in the most economically efficient or friendly way. We're going to talk about all the technology we're going to buy with it and what we're going to do to, again, help us overcome some of these issues in global warming or climate change. Um, I bet you if we did that, we might actually have a good shot at getting this policy passed, particularly in the state of California. So we got $17,500,000 coming in that's now split up over 90 people. Right. If you do that math, you're going to know that that's going to add up to about 100 and I don't know why it keeps doing that. About $194,000 or $194,444 per person. Right now, the question is, would you be willing to take a week off of school or work to lobby the government if you knew you would get about $194,000 a year if this uh, policy was passed? And the answer is probably. Most people would take a week off of school or work if it knew it meant getting $194,000 per year. Now, the next question is, would the other 17,500,000 people, would they be willing to take a week off of uh, school or work and lobby against the policy that's only going to cost them $1 per year? And the answer is probably not. So you're going to have 90 people outside the politician's door with uh, picket signs and bullhorns and promises of campaign contributions and votes if they get this policy passed. You're going to have nobody out there telling them not to pass this policy. So chances are this is a policy that will pass. And um, again, because the benefits are concentrated on a very well-organized group of people being our environmental economics class, and the costs are being widespread over a very unorganized group of people, the 17,500,000 employees or taxpayers in the state of California, right? So again, this is kind of a way in which the special interest effect works. I'll give you another example. There's a group called the Sugar Beet Growers of America. Which is a very powerful lobby or at least appears to be. And the sugar beet growers of America have convinced the government to put a tariff on uh, foreign sugar, meaning that if you wanted to buy sugar from other countries, then you would have to pay an extra high tax to do so. And the reason why they were able to convince, or the reason why they wanted to convince the government to pass this uh, tax against foreign sugar is so people will buy more um, uh, sugar grown here in the United States. So if you ever wonder why the Coca-Cola tastes different in the United States than it does in, say, Mexico, it's because Mexico uses sugar cane that's grown outside the United States, whereas in the United States they use the sugar from sugar beets, which are grown here within the United States, largely as a result of this tax. Now, if you're wondering how much does this tax cost us as individuals in the United States, well, this uh, tax does raise the price of sugar in the United States because, again, they don't have to compete with that foreign price. For uh, example, sugar is about 20 cents per pound in the U.S. If you're talking about its uh, wholesale price, Whereas worldwide, that same sugar is only going to cost six cents per pound or anywhere outside the U.S. Because, again, these U.S. sugar growers are protected by this uh, uh, tariff that they have lobbied very hard for. Now, if you're wondering, uh, again, like what does this do to us as Americans? Well, this means that we pay about $20 uh, more uh, for uh, uh, our sugar-related products each year per household. All right. So, again, this is going to cost each U.S. household $20 more. per year and higher prices. Now, a lot of people are like, yeah, it's not that much, and it's not, but here's the reason why the sugar growers are gonna wanna pass this policy is because there's not a lot of sugar beet growers in America, so when you concentrate that $20 per year and higher prices for each household on the limited number of sugar growers, it comes out to an additional
$30,000 per year in income for those U.S. sugar growers. So again, this is a policy that is going to hurt each household a little bit, but help each sugar grower a lot. And again, the sugar growers have a huge incentive to lobby for these things, right, in order to pass them. But they don't really have that big of an each household doesn't really have that big of an incentive to lobby against this, these kinds of policies, right? So these kinds of policies tend to get passed, and this is what is known as the special interest effect. It's actually a pretty common thing that exists here in the United States. So with that in mind, let's go through a couple more examples of kind of rent-seeking and crony capitalism. So in 2007, General Motors spent $14.5 million in lobbying-related expenses, so lobbying the government, giving them campaign contributions and things like that. In 2008, the same company spent about $13.3 million in lobbying-related ex expenses. So we're talking about, about $27.8 million that General Motors has spent lobbying the government. That is $27.8 million that they are not spending making their cars faster, better, and cheaper. And as you know, or as I'm sure many of you know, General Motors was one of those companies that found itself in a lot of trouble following that financial crisis of 2008. And so when they ended up um, starting to struggle during that crisis, they ended up lobbying the government for a bailout. And of course, they got one. So from 2008 to 2009, General Motors received about $25 billion of your taxpayer dollars in government bailouts. So for them, it was probably worth it, spending $27.8 million to get $25 billion in bailouts. So the government was able to bail out General Motors under the whole guise or idea that it's a company that's just too big to fail. Eh, maybe. Or maybe, again, it's just the result of all those millions of dollars spent in lobbying. Uh, AIG, an investment company that was also struggling during this financial crisis, spent $9.7 million in lobbying-related expenses in 2008. And then, along with other investment banks who were making bad loans that kind of got us into this financial crisis, ended up receiving $180 billion in bailouts over that 2008 to 2009 period. So again, it looks like the companies that are lobbying the government are certainly getting those special favors. And again, the problem here is that, one, this lobbying money is money that's not being spent making better business decisions so that you wouldn't need these bailouts to begin with. And then the second issue is that it gives them an unfair advantage over competition, right? The companies that are receiving bailouts have an unfair advantage over companies who don't receive said bailouts, right? Now, again, you could argue that, hey, these businesses staying in business is going to be important for the U.S. economy. Well, then why is it that they receive these bailouts, but other businesses... Uh, over these years have gone out of business. For example, in the last 10 years, these are some major companies that have gone out of business. Uh, Wild Airlines, Payless Shoes, Ulta Motors, Toys R Us, Ruby Tuesday Restaurant, Sports Authority, the a and Grocery Store, Old Country Buffet, Blockbuster Video, and Borders Books are all large companies that have uh, been allowed to go out of business over the last 10 years. Right? Why isn't that they were too big to fail or why isn't that the government bailed them out? Well, chances are because they didn't have the same lobbying presence that these other companies had, right? So in the very real sense, it's usually about who you know uh, rather than what you know or how well you're doing, right? So again, this is a uh, potential issue, not only again in the inefficient use of these uh, funds on rent seeking, but also again in creating unfair playing field through crony capitalism and again encouraging or incentivizing more negative behavior in the future after all, why should you worry about making your products faster, better, and cheaper if you can get a, uh, a bailout through spending more money lobbying the government instead, right? So with that in mind, right, let's go ahead and watch a couple videos on this idea of crony capitalism. In the interest of keeping, thing fa keeping things fair, I'm going to go ahead and show two, one that attacks our current President Trump and the other that attacks former President uh, Obama. Again, just to show you that this isn't something that's more of a conservative thing or a liberal thing. This is something that exists across both sides of the political spectrum. This is just more of a politician thing. In other words, all politicians, no matter what they say, when they get in office, kind of face the same incentives, right? So why are some companies allowed to fail and not others? Well, usually because of, again, these um, uh, the amount of lobbying or rent-seeking that comes from these companies. With that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at these videos and talk a little bit about crony capitalism and uh, how it tends to exist.
In late 2016, former Governor Sarah Palin accused President-elect Donald Trump of taking part in crony capitalism. This was following a deal Trump made with an air conditioning company to keep a number of jobs in the United States. Many believe Trump used his new powers to sway the deal, which involved $7 million in incentives to the company. This outwardly has the potential to stray into favoritism, the basis of crony capitalism. So what exactly is crony capitalism? Well, the term is generally defined as businesses which benefit from favoritism by government officials. There are varying forms of the practice and can be most easily understood in terms of economic rent. This term refers to the difference in what an industry or business would normally be able to earn in a free market and what they are able to earn as a result of government influence. An easy to understand example is the system of taxis versus car sharing services like Lyft or Uber. In certain areas, car sharing is cheaper because effectively anybody can drive. Whereas to drive a taxi, you need an expensive license called a medallion, which are limited in number. The medallion system is an artificial method of increasing the economic rent or price of the service so that drivers don't have to compete and the barrier to entry is very high. Car sharing represents the free market, while taxi medallions exist as a form of crony capitalism. In many countries, certain industries are considered to be economically rent heavy, including casinos, oil and gas, real estate, telecommunications, and others. These industries can get tax breaks or special legal treatment as a result of lobbying, unionizing, and sometimes even outright corruption. In 2016, The Economist released a list of the countries suffering from crony capitalism the most. By calculating the wealth of billionaires within those industries as compared to the overall GDP, the disproportion of economic rent becomes clear. Topping the list is Russia, which sees roughly 18% of the country's GDP in the hands of billionaires in crony industries. This figure is considerably higher than any other country on the list and stems from the unique combination of Russia being a major world power with a history of government favoritism. Following the fall of the Soviet Union, most high capital industries were overtaken by oligarchs who became extremely wealthy off of former state resources while shutting out any potential free market competition. In fact, of Russia's 77 billionaires, one of the richest made his fortune by selling shares of government industries for private loans through a government sanctioned program. However, it's not all bad news. According to The Economist, the share of crony billionaire industries has fallen by as much as 16% in the past two years, due in part to a global crackdown on the worst forms of crony capitalism, such as corruption. And while this share of so-called crony wealth is consistent among wealthy countries, developing countries have managed to diversify their wealth away from those industries. Since 2008, the share of wealth has fallen from 7% to just 4%, an incredible leap considering how much easier it is to call government favor in less developed regions. The Economist ranks Donald Trump at number 104 in individual cronyism due to his business dealings in real estate and casinos. However, the United States itself only ranks as number 16th worldwide. Trump favoring certain industries over others has already begun to happen. Just how far it'll go remains to be seen. But while Trump may use his presidency to enrich the businesses he prefers, many worry he may use it to enrich himself and his family. In fact, this practice is known in other parts of the world as kleptocracy. So what exactly does that mean, and who have been the most notorious kleptocrats in the world? Find out in this video. Not only did Duvalier siphon as much as $800 million, according to Transparency International, he spent state funds on many personal expenses. In one case, he allegedly spent millions on a wedding for himself. Thanks for watching Seeker Daily. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos every day. All right. So, and looking at that video, we can see that some rent seeking and special interests and crony capitalism are certain, certainly taking place under the current President uh, Trump administration. Uh, but again, it tends to happen under every administration because of the incentives that politicians tend to face. So if you're asking, well, what does this have to do with environmental economics? Well, the idea that the uh, uh, short sightedness effect being rampant among politicians certainly might play a role in whether or not we choose to protect the environment now. Right? Also, the fact that uh, we do have this rent-seeking and crony capitalism Right, could extend into environmental industries. So with that in mind, let's take a look at this late next clip here on rent-seeking, special interests, and crony capitalism as it existed under the Obama administration with regards to energy-efficient windows. Again, maybe in the guise of protecting or helping the environment, certain industries were protected and helped uh, given a competitive advantage over others. Let's take a look. When he says crony capitalism, what's he talking about? Well... Suppose you're in the window business. How do you get a leg up on the competition? Sure would help if government gave you a special tax credit. 
and gave your customers stimulus money to buy your product. It would help even more if somehow you could get the president and the vice president of the United States to say nice things about your company. But come on, that's not possible, is it? No company could be that fortunate. There are three big companies in the window business. Pella, Anderson, and Marvin. Marvin windows and doors fit your vision. The recession's been tough on these companies. But then there's also a much smaller company, Sirius Materials. Sirius is booming, according to this article in Fortune, on a roll, according to Inc. magazine, which puts Sirius as CEO in its cover with a story titled, How to Build a Great Company. How did he do it? Well, he had some help from high places. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, uh, for your unwavering support. That's well, Vice President Biden he's thanking. Jobs. Without you and the Recovery Act, this would not have been possible. Biden returned the compliments. You're not just churning out windows. You're making some of the most energy efficient windows in the world. I would argue the most energy efficient windows in the world. Other window makers say, no, our windows are just as energy efficient. But the vice president hasn't visited their companies or even mentioned their names. And why am I talking about the vice president? I'm here today representing Sirius Materials. How many company officials get to make introductions like this? It is my distinct honor to introduce the President of the United States, President Barack Obama. The President gave a speech on energy policy that cited, guess which company? Serious Materials just reopened, as he mentioned, a manufacturing plant outside of Pittsburgh. And these workers will now have a new mission, producing some of the most energy efficient windows in the world. Wow, what a dream endorsement. And just last week, the President announced a new set of tax credits for so-called green companies. The only window company on the list? Serious Materials. This is a story of how a new economy predicated on innovation and efficiency is not only helping us today, but in inspiring a better tomorrow. Actually, I think it's a story about crony capitalism. It's almost as if the government and Serious Materials are partners. The company VP of Policy testified in Congress. Thank you for the opportunity to appear here today and share serious materials experience in creating green jobs. And here he is in this picture with so-called energy leaders at the U.S. Department of Energy. And who's the woman in the middle? Kathy Zoy, who oversees the government's weatherization program. She has big plans for your tax money, as she explained at a conference. Where literally SWAT teams go into neighborhoods and they retrofit every single house and every single business on Main Street. Oh, and I left out a little fact. Kathy Zoy is the wife of the vice president of policy of Sirius Windows. So of all the window companies in America, maybe it's a coincidence that the one that gets presidential and vice presidential attention and a special tax credit is one where company executives give thousands of dollars to the Obama campaign and where the policy director spends nights at home with the energy department's weatherization boss. It could be coincidence. And there's apparently nothing illegal about this. In Kathy Zoy's ethics agreement, she did disclose her marriage and says she would recuse herself from any matter that had a predictable effect on her financial interests. But it sure looks funny to me. And it's odd that even the liberal media has so much interest in this one company. Vice President Biden says the stimulus bill's funding for making buildings more energy efficient is expected to drive up demand for the kinds of windows made by Sirius Materials, which has caused the company to ramp up its production. That's how it works. Economic stimulus. Ta-da! Ta-da is right. That is how it works. But government handouts that go to one favored company, why is that right? All right, so as you can see, this crony capitalism or cronyism is something that tends to exist across the board, across both political spectrums, and of course creates not only an imbalance in competition, but again leads to some perverse incentives as it encourages more companies to engage in lobbying rather than maybe a more efficient use of their money and time in terms of production. So with that in mind, that is kind of some of the sources of government failure that might make you want to shy away from maybe some of these government solutions. Again, these government solutions are designed to overcome that market failure, but then that government failure is going to pop up and you just got to decide what you'd rather deal with. Would you rather deal with the market failure or the government failure? Again, this perfection doesn't really exist in either case. So 
Mixing too much government control into our environmental solutions could lead to corruption and inefficiency, right? So again, we've got to decide exactly how much involved uh, or how involved we want the government to be with some of these environmental solutions. Again, maybe a little bit of government is good, maybe too much government is bad, right? Uh, again, sometimes this comes down to personal preference as to what you'd rather deal with, the market failure or that government failure. So continuing on here, let's talk a little bit about uh, combining government control with a more decentralized attitude as we talk about the evolution of tradable pollution permits. And we'll start with the Clean Air Act of 1970, where new uh, firms are subject to pollution limits. So with regards to the Clean Air Act, right, again, as we've talked about back in Chapter 1, uh, if you are a new firm, then you are now subject to these more stringent uh, pollution controls. Older firms that are already existing kind of were grandfathered in to where they didn't have to meet these new requirements. But if they started to retrofit or change their building, then again, they would be subject to these new regulations as well. We already talked about one of the secondary effects of that in terms of leading some companies to keep their uh, older, less uh, clean factory intact versus moving on to a newer, more cleaner or uh, energy efficient factory. Um, so with that in mind, part of this policy involved new firms uh, paying existing firms for pollution credits to help offset the emissions of these new firms, right? So again, if you are a new firm who were um, uh, not operating under these new rules and you could actually pay the existing firms for pollution credits that the existing firms didn't need because, again, they weren't uh, uh, as uh, following these more stringent uh, rules due to the fact of them being grandfathered in under the new policy, and the government established a greenhouse emission standard saying this is the uh, total amount of pollution that we are going to allow according to the Earth's assimilative capacity and what we've deemed to be the efficient or optimal level of emissions. But it's up to you all to decide how much you want to emit personally, right? So uh, we're going to allow institutions to trade with one another or buy and sell these pollution permits. So once again, the reason why this is government control combined with a decentralized attitude is that again, we're controlling the total number of emissions, but you're allowing firms to choose for themselves how they wanna operate under this policy in terms of deciding what the optimal level of emissions are for them, right? So this kind of led to what is known as the cap and trade policy, where the central authority determines the aggregate quantity of emissions and then distributes permits to polluters. And then from there, polluters are allowed to trade those permits as they see fit. So examples, consider a single firm which emits 5,000 tons a year and is given 2,500 tons worth of permits. What can that firm do? Well, it's got a couple of options. If they're used to emitting 5,000 tons a year and they're only given 2,500 tons worth of permits, then that firm can either reduce emissions to 2,500 tons, which means they gotta figure out a way to get rid of 2,500 tons of emissions, and that's gonna increase the firm's abatement costs. Another thing you can do is it can sell permits to other firms in order to generate permit revenue, but then it's going to have to get rid of more than 2,500 tons of emissions. That's going to increase abatement costs even further. Or their third option is they can buy permits from other firms, right? So they might not have to reduce their uh, emissions from 5,000 all the way down to 2,500. They can uh, uh, reduce them less than that, or they can not reduce them at all and go ahead and buy those permits from other firms. This will lower the abatement cost for the firm, but they will have to pay these other firms for those permits. Right, so that's kind of the options that this particular firm has. And let's go ahead and walk through a quick graph about how they're going to decide what to do. Right, so what should the firm do? Well, it's going to depend on the permit price versus their marginal abatement cost curve. Right, and again, we're going to illustrate that graphically. Let's go ahead and take a look. So we're going to again exit the full screen mode so that we can use some different colors here. Starting off with drawing our graph. That looks something like this. So again, we're going to be measuring our damages over here and then emissions on the vertical axis. Once again, we're going to have a marginal abatement cost curve that's going to look something like this. That part hasn't changed. And let's say that we've got a constant permit price of $40. 
Again, forty dollars being the cost per uh, permit there. Right now, as we talked about this firm, if unregulated, would emit a total of uh, five thousand emissions. Right, if given the option um, uh, or not having to pay for a permit, that's how much that they would emit. But now we have this uh, uh, policy in place, right, to where they're going to have to reduce their emissions and where that permit price given by this flat line here intersects their marginal abatement cost curve. That's going to determine this firm's optimal level of emissions. Right, and we'll say that's at 2,500. So again, when our MAC is equal to permit price, we get an equilibrium. And if that permit price is $40, then the firm will reduce emissions until MAC is equal to $40. So again, firm will reduce emissions until their marginal abatement cost is equal to the permit price, which in this case, is going to be equal to forty dollars. Oh, let me do that. All right. So, with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at why this is the case. Let's say that a firm is currently sitting at two thousand five hundred and one levels of emissions. Right here. Right. Well, at two thousand five hundred and one, wherever that hits the marginal abatement cost curve, this is their marginal abatement cost to get rid of that uh, next emission. Let's say for the example here that it is like $38 or just some amount less than this line here at $40, which is the permit price, right? If this is the permit price, then as we can see, it'd be cheaper for the firm to get rid of that emission than to pay the $40 for, uh, to get a permit from another firm. So they're going to reduce that emission down to $2,500. Now, let's say that the firm is sitting at 2,499 emissions. Again, the marginal abatement cost of getting rid of that last emission might have been $42. Whereas, again, our permit price is equal to $40. So the marginal abatement cost of $42 is higher than the permit price of $40, which is why they won't uh, choose to uh, abate that particular emission. Because the cost of getting rid of that emission is higher than the cost of obtaining a permit to get that emission. Uh, so with that in mind, let's just go ahead and quickly review this firm's behavior. So at... 2,501 emissions, marginal abatement cost is less than the permit price. In other words, it's cheaper to abate that emission than it is to buy a permit to have that emission. So if that's the case, then firms will reduce emissions. And again, they'll continue to do that until the cost of getting rid of emission is going to be equal to the permit price necessary to have that emission. So at anything below 2,500, so like 2,499 emissions, it's the case that a marginal abatement cost is now greater than the permit price. Organic costs more to get rid of that emission than it is to buy a permit to have that emission exist. So firms will 
increase emissions and get us to that optimal amount where the permit price is equal to our marginal abatement cost. So that's how firms tend to behave with regards to uh, these tradable pollution permits in general. All right, so with that in mind, we are going to extend our discussion of tradable pollution permits to two firms. And we're going to save that for the third and final lecture video for Chapter 6. Uh, it's kind of one of the more complicated graphs, and we're already over an hour into this particular video. So I want to save that for a uh, third video, and we'll finish out Chapter 6 by talking about how two firms will engage in trading permits and uh, uh, finding that optimal amount of pollution for that firm, given the permit price and their respective marginal abatement costs. So with that in mind, that is it for part two of chapter six. Once again, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email or come visit me during those Zoom office hours, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, other than that, just yeah, let me know if you need anything, and I will see you next video for the conclusion to chapter six. We'll talk about tradable pollution permits across two firms. Uh, so yeah, just let me know if there's anything I can do to help you out with these with the graphs and math so far in chapter six. But until then, take care.